we're going to need some local tools. So let's get them installed. In this video, we're going to be setting up a few local tools on our machines. We're going to be installing Minikube and Kind, then we're going to install kubectl, and then finally we're going to install Docker. Now we need Minikube, Kind, or Docker for our local clusters. So Minikube and Kind are backed by Docker. Minikube can use other things, um, but we're going to use Docker. And basically what happens is they spin up Docker containers, which are then treated like clusters essentially. So each container would be a node on the cluster. We're then going to install kubectl so that we can interact with those clusters, whether it be production or local ones. So let's get going. Here we are on the Kubernetes documentation website, and there's a few different ways to get to some of the tools. We can do a search, we can go down to reference and go to all the tools or set up tools or a few other things. But I'm gonna start by just going over to tasks and install tools. Under here, we'll see some of the common things that we might require for interfacing with Kubernetes and running one locally, as in running a cluster locally. I'm gonna be running on Windows subsystem for Linux, so I'm gonna need the kubectl version for Linux. This is kubectl and this is the thing we use to interface with the API of the Kubernetes server. We can also use curl, but to make life easier, we use kubectl. There's also a tool called kind, which is for running a local Kubernetes cluster on your computer. And there's also minikube, which is kind of like kind, but just works a little bit differently really. But again, it just runs an all-in-one cluster on your local computer. Finally, there's kubeadm. Kubeadm came along to make running Kubernetes clusters easier, as in building them. So once upon a time, we used to generate the system CTL services and we'd have to set up the services manually and run Kubernetes that way. I mean, we still can do that. I've actually got an article on Medium showing you how to do that, but kubeadm just makes life easier. So why make your life harder when you've got this option to make it easier? We're going to start off with kubectl. So if I click on install kubectl on Linux, because that's what I'm technically going to need for Windows subsystem for Linux. We can go ahead and follow the guide here to install kubectl. Now, you need to make sure you've got the right version for your cluster. So if you're running a 126 cluster, then you need to grab the 126 kubectl. You could, in theory, grab the 1.25 or the 1.27, and it would work because it has a one minor difference either way, so one up and one down, uh, compatibility. So in theory, you could use one of those two, but you might as well get the one that works for your cluster because it makes sense. We're going to probably be going for the latest version and the latest version is going to be, well, let's have a look. So if I run the command here, we can see the latest version is 126.1. And I know that because there's this command inside the URL, which basically grabs the latest version. Okay, so we can grab that. And if I switch back to my terminal and paste that in, this will download kubectl. Now, if you wanted a different version of kubectl, then all you'd need to do is Google Kubernetes releases and click on this. And in here, we've got all these different versions. So we can see here, we've got 1.26. And then here we've got 1.25.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 1.24.1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to nine. And all we'd have to do is take that number. And in our terminal, we could go ahead and remove this command that's in the brackets and the dollar sign and paste that in with a V at the start. And we know it's got a V at the start because when we ran this command on its own, we had V1.26.1. Now if I ran that, that would download this version of the binary. I don't want that, so I'm not gonna do that. But you can see that's how you get a different version if you need it. So we've got it downloaded. The next step will be to verify the binary. So to do that, we can grab the SHA-256 and run that checksum test essentially. So we'll grab that. And now that's finished, we can go ahead and run this command here, which will test the SHA-256 checksum against the binary itself. And what this is, is when the binary is created, the developers will generate a SHA-256 sum against it. And that will always be the same, however you generate it. So you know if it's changed that it's broken essentially. So they'll generate it, create this file here, and then you can download it and run it against it yourself and say, I'm just gonna be checking this and it should come out the same. And we can see here that it is, it's okay. If it failed, you'd see something like this. You'd need to re-download the binary and the shard again, just to make sure both of them are fine and never got corrupted on download. And if it's still happening, don't use that binary because there's a chance Slim chance, but a chance that it's been corrupted by something else or it's been interfered with by a malicious actor. There's many reasons not to use it. Finally, we're gonna go ahead and install it. So let's do that. And by running this, I can enter my password and we now have kubectl in this location. 
you can see here i've got kubectl i mean yes i also have minikube and kind but i'm still going to take you through the process of downloading them i've got these on my computer anyway because i use kubernetes a lot as you may have figured so what this command has done is it's installed using the owner of root and the group of root with this octal permission kubectl into this location now it doesn't move this file into this it just essentially copies it with these permissions so we will need to remove that from our current location so i'm going to do that and now we can just test it so how can we test it down here it gives us an example so we can just copy this kubectl version hyphen hyphen client and it will complain because there's going to be deprecation going on and it gives you an example which actually down here is the example that it gives us so if we run that we can get the client version and we can see here that everything's in place you know we've got the latest version it gives us the compiler gives us the versions and everything's yeah it you know, tells us the go version it was built with the git version the minor and the major so that's it everything's good to go you'll notice however if we didn't put client on we'd get this error at the bottom. The connection to server localhost 8080 was refused. That's because this is the server request. So if I just change client for server, we'll see we get that error. And the reason being that there is no such host, there's, there's nothing there. But we will have a cluster soon, so this will work soon. We'll leave that as it is. That's kubectl set up and ready to go. The next thing we need to do is grab kind. So if we go back to the install tools, now we can do kind or minikube, but we'll do both for the sake of brevity. I'm gonna go ahead and click kind and we'll get that done first. So you can do it with a package manager, release binaries or source. I'm not going to be going for package manager or source because I don't want to have to compile from source and the package manager, I can't guarantee it's going to be up to date. It probably will be because I'll be used in their uh, apt repo and yeah, but I, I prefer to grab the binaries because I can be in control of how things are updated. Um, when I run apt upgrade, for example, it's not just going to go ahead and upgrade things. You can mark things as held in apt, but again, I'd rather just grab the binaries myself. It's completely up to you. I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to copy and paste again so I can grab that binary and then go ahead and change the modification of it by adding executable and finally move it. Now we could run that command again, this the install command, it's not specific to kubectl. People do things different ways. Personally, I actually prefer this because it moves the binary over, but again, it's completely up to you, it's your choice. If you wanna use that install command again, that's fine. So I'm gonna run that command and now I've got kind up and running, ready to go. So I can do kind uh, version, I believe, and there it is, there's my kind version. Finally, I'm going to go back and grab Minikube and I want Linux, I want x86, the stable one and the binary. Again, you could do package install if you want. So I'll go ahead and just grab this link. I'm not going to be running this install command. I personally don't use the install command that often. It's completely up to you though. If you'd rather use the install command, you can. So all I need to do next is chmod. Yeah, I'll just do plus x against Minikube. And then I will go ahead and move Minikube over to user local bin. Uh, mini cube and um, permission denied of course because i didn't put sudo at the start and now i should just be able to run mini cube hyphen hyphen version oh no just version yeah there we go okay sometimes things use hyphen hyphen version so yeah apologies uh, anyway we can see here the mini cube version is the latest one and that's it we have all those binaries ready to go now the last one we looked at was cube adm cube adm we can use locally if we wanted to we could create a single node cluster on our machine but there's no point in using cube adm for a local cluster you might as well use minikube or kind i personally prefer kind as well so going through i will be using kind more than i will minikube but i will give a quick example on minikube cube adm is what you would install on the main nodes of your cluster instead so if you have some vm set up for example we'd put cube adm on all of them and then cube adm would be used to initialize those nodes as either control plane nodes or work nodes and yeah i mean in theory you could use kubeadm to set it up locally because kubeadm just installs containers to manage the control plane and things like that but we won't be using kubeadm just now but it's worth noting that where that is because we will be coming back to this to install it later down the line the final thing we're going to need is docker because kind requires docker minikube can use docker although it doesn't require it there's other things that it can do but again just use Docker, it's there, it's available to you. You might as well use it. So finally, we'll click on Docker here. We'll grab Docker for whichever version you need. I know I've got the Linux versions for everything else, but this time I'm gonna be using Docker Desktop for Windows because my main operating system is Windows. <gasps> and that plugs into Windows Subsystem for Linux. This version, uh, Docker Desktop for Linux, will not work on Windows Subsystem to Linux. So yeah, I mean, you might be able to grab the Docker binary and use that in Windows Subsystem for Linux. I've never actually tried that, but why bother when this works? So we go on to here we would click download desktop for windows. Once that's downloaded, click on this and go through the installation procedure. I have already got Docker installed. 
So I will just go ahead and open that and show you what you need to do once it's installed. During the installation process, it may prompt you for WSL support. Tick anything that it asks you about, just make sure that it gets set up. Once it's all set up, you'll be taken to the following window. And then all we need to do is just wait for Docker to start. And now that it's started, all we need to do is make sure it's set up to work with subsystem for Linux. So if I was to run Docker in subsystem for Linux without having it configured, this command would fail. Case in point, if I go ahead and just restart the service, we should see this won't work. You see that? The command fails. Once this is started back up, this will start to work again. So we'll just give it a second. And now that's back up and running. Same command suddenly works. So this is what I mean. It, it does work once it's plugged in. So to plug it in, all you need to do is click settings, click on resources, click on WSL integration, check this box here, turn it on for your distribution and just click apply and restart. Now there is a Kubernetes option here where you can enable Kubernetes and install a cluster, but it doesn't use the latest version. I wouldn't recommend using this personally for learning things if you're trying to learn how to set up a cluster because this won't teach you how to set up a cluster. It just starts as it says, a single no cluster. And that's it. We've got Docker ready to go. We've got WSL working with Docker. We've got Kind, we've got Minikube and we've got kubectl. So now we can get going with spinning up some clusters. And that's it. You've got everything you need to get going. We're going to set up some local clusters in the next video using Minikube and Kind. And then we'll take a look at the following videos at setting up production style clusters using Cube ADM. We'll be doing that in VMs. So if you've got the power on your machine, get ready to set up some VMs, either using VirtualBox or Libvirt if you're on Linux, whatever it is that you use for setting up VMs. So yeah, next video, Minikube and Kind, local clusters, videos afterwards, production ones. So I'll see you in the next one.